up, swashbucklers? You're listening to Under the Crossbones, episode number 181. My name is Phil Johnson. I am your host for the show and the ship's beer can recycler each and every week. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling your friends, visiting sponsors, sending donations, all that cool stuff that you do that helps me keep the old boat afloat. And if you haven't done any of that, eh, eh, maybe think about it. I don't know. Uh, Here we are, episode number 181. Fun fact about the number 181. uh, Retired American thoroughbred horse racing jockey Randy Romero won a track record 181 races at the Fairgrounds Race Course in New Orleans, Louisiana. So, a little bit of a New Orleans uh, Lafitte uh, pirate. There's our pirate connection uh, for the retired uh, horse racing jockey <laughs> who won 181 races at the course in New Orleans. Pretty cool. Uh, my guest on the show today, got a cool one for you. This is uh, today we got Brad Williamson. He's the CEO of treasureexpeditions.com. Uh, treasure hunter on land, under the sea, all that kind of good stuff. Plenty of pirate cred that we're going to hear about. Uh, he's got some great stories about uh, uh, Mel Fisher and Louis Anderson, who has not come up on this show before. And yeah, it's that Louis Anderson. Uh, we're going to hear about uh, running off to find the treasure of the Incas. Uh, his experiences on... Um, Expedition Unknown and on uh, Caribbean Pirate Treasure with uh, uh, Philippe Cousteau. We're going to talk about uh, Jose Gaspar and uh, La Bousse and all sorts of great stuff. So there's lots of good things coming up in this episode. You're going to you're going to dig this one. He's a a big pirate fan and we like pirate fans here. Uh, quick little heads up about 15 minutes into our talk. There is a siren. Uh, in the background uh, that was happening. I don't know, on his end, my end, I'm not sure where it was coming from, but I know like oftentimes when you're listening to a podcast, you're in the car, you're driving, and then like you're listening to a song or something and a siren pops up and all of a sudden you're like, ah, where's the siren? It's not behind you in this case. I'm 99% sure it's not behind you in this case. So when you hear about 15 minutes in our talk, you hear a siren, it's not behind you on the freeway, uh, just so you know. On the other hand, there might be a siren around you on the freeway. So look anyway. Just look anyway. Just be aware of your surroundings. That's the lesson for today. Uh, If you're enjoying the show, I hope you are. Come join us over on Facebook, facebook.com slash under the crossbones. On Twitter, we're at under crossbones. Uh, And of course, you can subscribe to the show in whatever you're listening to this on right now. Uh, Whatever podcatcher you like anywhere where you can get audio, there will be a subscribe button. Hit that little subscribe button and you'll get the new episodes uh, downloaded to your device automatically every Tuesday morning when they come out. It's just that easy. And of course, all the show notes for this episode will be at underthecrossbones.com slash 181. So, fiddly food. Uh, I don't know... (laughs) Some of you just, I know maybe you just thought I was swearing at something. That's not how I swear. Uh, here's what I, my girlfriend and I, uh, we're doing this new thing where each weekend we're going to go try one new restaurant. And we have uh, rather different tastes in food. So we've each made a list of restaurants uh, that we are going to go visit. And it was her turn this past weekend. And she likes hot pot. Uh, or she's always enamored with the idea of hot pot, uh, which if you don't know what hot pot is, it's like Asian fondue, I guess is a good way of describing it. So what they do is... Uh, they uh, first they overcharge you uh, and then they bring you a pot of boiling broth of some sort and you can order different kinds of broths. And then they bring you a whole bunch of different uh, meats and vegetables to cook in the broth as you're eating it. Uh, and uh, and here's the th- that's what I mean by fiddly food. Uh, you're cooking as you're eating it. So you dunk a thing in, you put it in your mouth, you get some rice or some noodles there. And the, the food, is, the food's all right. Uh, it's not super exciting to me. Uh, but this particular place brought me a tray of chicken. That was sliced so thin I could see the tray through the chicken. Uh, I don't. I've never seen wispy chicken before, but this was wispy chicken, uh, and uh, for the price I was paying, it was probably maybe I don't know an eighth of a chicken breast that was on this tray. All told, it was all nicely spread out, uh, but it was sliced so thin it was ridiculous. And then there was uh, things in there that I don't generally like to put in uh, in a hot broth like cabbage uh, and bamboo. I'm not a. That's not. Uh, that's not. I'm not a veggie guy uh, all that much there. So uh, we did the thing. But what it gets me about, I like, I love cooking. I enjoy cooking. I love and enjoy eating. I've discovered I don't enjoy doing those two things at the same time. Uh, just the whole, the toiling away. Now, there is an element to some of it uh, when you do like shabu shabu uh, or, or fondue or all the different variations of this type of meal 
where it's a communal thing where there's a pot in the middle and everybody's kind of dunking their stuff in there and you're talking and, and I can get behind that. You know, that's OK. But this was you have your own pot of broth and you're just toiling away for the whole just toiling, just dunking and eating and dunking and eating. I'm looking across the table and she's dunking and eating. And uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't like to cook while I'm eating. I do like to eat while I'm cooking <laughs> somehow. <laughs> You've done that, right? Where you're just cooking and just keep tasting, keep tasting. And, and uh, eventually you're like, oh, I've eaten too much. and I'm not hungry anymore. So anyway, uh, hot pot, uh, not my thing. Fondue, I guess. OK, uh, it was overpriced for what it is as far as I'm concerned. But uh, plus with the hot pot, there's no giant bowl of melted cheese. And if you don't get a giant bowl of melted cheese and a large quantity of bread, I am going to be less interested in it. So now I have to go earn the money uh, to pay for the hot pot. So uh, this week shows. Yeah, um, busy week, busy, busy week on uh, Wednesday, the 13th. I'll be performing at the Greenery in Walnut Creek, California on Thursday, the 14th at the Bear River Casino in Lolita, California, and Friday, the 15th at the All Out Comedy Theater in Oakland, California. And then a couple weeks out on the 28th, I'll be at the Familia Bistro in Modesto, California. Uh, Those are all going to be fantastic shows. There's not a single one of those I'm not looking forward to. So that's good. If you want to get all the information on the tour dates, you want to come and see me tell some jokes and sing some songs, go to underthecrossbones.com. Click on the tour dates button and it will let you know what's happening next week. I don't have any shows next week. Ah, that's going to be weird. Um, I don't know. It just happened that way. Just the schedule worked out. I wasn't even trying to hold time open for whatever. Yeah, it's just, yeah, no shows next week. But anyway, uh, it's going to be good this week. It'll be fun making lots of money. And that's a good thing, right? We're sponsored today by Tee Public. Uh, I, they make uh, T-shirts. And what Tee Public does is they they cooperate with artists, T-shirt artists, and the T-shirt artists uh, supply the designs. Uh, T Public supplies the e-commerce part of it, and uh, and then uh, I send you guys over there, and everybody gets a little piece of the pie, and it's a good thing all the way around. So I have curated a selection of over a hundred super cool pirate T-shirts for you, and you can see them at underthecrossbones.com/shirt. We got funny ones and sexy ones and scary ones. Whatever kind of pirate t-shirt you need, because let's face it, you need more pirate t-shirts. Don't we all? I'm wearing one right now, and I still need more. All my, my drawers are all full of pirate t-shirts, and I still need more. Go to underthecrossbones.com slash shirt, and you can see the super cool over 100 t-shirts, pirate shirts that I have curated for you from Tee Public. okay? Go check it out, underthecrossbones.com slash shirt. If you want to help support the show in other ways, go to underthecrossbones.com slash support. And right there, there's a little PayPal box where you can uh, dunk a, a donation in there of whatever amount you like. Maybe say the price of a bottle of rum is a good uh, a good starting point. There's also an Amazon banner there. If you click that Amazon banner, you go buy yourself something nice from Amazon. I don't know if they sell rum at Amazon. They probably do. They sell everything else. You buy yourself something nice from Amazon. Amazon kicks me back a few shekels, and that helps support the show as well. If you'd like to be a sponsor of the show, if you've got a product or service that you think pro, uh, pirates would like, we can take care of that as well. All that information available on underthecrossbones.com slash support. All right, so let's do this. Let's get into my talk here with Brad Williamson, and he is quite a character. Uh, I think you're going to really enjoy this story, uh, this interview. He's got a lot of cool stories, a lot of cool experiences. There's definitely a little bit of Indiana Jones in this guy, uh, and it's a, it's a fun one. All right, so let's do it. Here's my talk with Brad Williamson. I find when I'm doing a lot of projects, whether it's filming or actively being out in the field, it's good to have a sense of humor. And I don't take myself too seriously. I've, I've worked with people that, you know, sometimes you'd almost think they have like a godlike complex. Sure. I'm no different from anyone else. I count my blessings that I've been able to go on and be a part of some of these and lead some of these very successful expeditions, both here in the U.S. and internationally you know, recovering buried and sunken treasure, doing filming. And I'm just so appreciative to life that I I have this opportunity and I'm no different from anyone else. I'm I'm so grateful for it. And I'm, I don't take myself seriously and I find it's easier to laugh because there are sometimes, you know, being out in the field, it's, it's very tough. Uh, It's demanding or even filming. People don't realize when we're on site filming, they can be the, – the days can literally be 18-hour days. Sure. Yep. A lot of people think if they've watched some of the episodes of TV that I've been on that it's like, oh, that must be so much fun and glamorous. 
I, I even tell the production companies before we go on location, I know I'm probably not going to sleep for the next week while we're on location. So I'm getting all the sleep I can get right now. Yep. And ha- having a good sense of humor, I think goes a long way as a, po- you know, when you're out there because it's a working hard, but you want to make it enjoyable and laugh and have fun and um, not take yourself too seriously in life. Totally agree. I absolutely agree. And, uh, and yeah, the filming thing, people definitely underestimate the work that goes into that. Cause I've spent many 18 hour days on film sets myself and uh, yeah, it's, it's always an interesting and exhausting adventure, but uh, so let's, uh, let's do this. Let's lay out a little pirate cred here at the beginning. Okay. Uh, tell me about your, your pirate experience and then we'll kind of go from there and dig into the history. Oh, my, my pirate experience. I, you know, I have to tell you, what really got me interested in pirates and piracy and pirate treasure was, of course, you know, the legendary um, Jose Gaspar, the Gaspar okay. Festival that takes place. When I was a kid, okay, this segueing just a little bit, how I even got involved in the interest with treasure. And this is a true story. I was down in Key West. And I was probably about 11, maybe 12 at the time. It, it was different times. I, you know, I could be wandering around by myself uh-huh. and there were these pirate museums and I was going to those, you know, looking at all the, you know, the, the pirate, pirate flags and seeing these pirates and seeing the treasure. And then I remember seeing off in the distance, what to me at that age, I thought was, you know, a pirate galleon, you know, a pirate ship, a, a treasure galleon. And I'm like, Oh, I, I've got to go see that. So I went there and it was this replica of, you know, a Spanish galleon. Well, to me, it also looked like a pirate ship too. Uh-huh. I'm running all around it. I'm looking at the cannons and I didn't see anyone there at the time. And up towards the front of the ship, it's called you know, the forecastle where they have the, um, uh, the quarters towards the front of the ship. I went in there and there was this ladder that went down to the lower decks. And I'm like, I wonder where everyone is. There's a sign that said, wait here, but no one's there. So I said, well, let me go down there. And I'm looking, and it was just like something out of either Treasure Island or, or the, the Goonies. Steven Spielberg. Okay. There's this treasure everywhere, and there, you know, there's these skeletons with these treasure chests. And I'm thinking, like, wow, this is great. You know, pirates and pirate treasure and everything. Still didn't see anyone. And I'm going through this, but this is what got started the bug in me. And I remember looking around. I finally found someone towards the back end of the ship in the upper decks. And the person said, well, you know, if you want to go on the tour, you have to pay. Uh-huh. A precocious a little 11-year-old, I'm thinking to myself, well, I'm not paying. I just saw the whole thing. <laughs> so I'm like, Why do you want me to pay? I'm going down the gangplank, and there's this gentleman coming up you know, the other way on the gangplank. And I say to him, I'm like, hey, mister, I wouldn't go on that ship if I were you. He's like, Why? I said, they charge you. They make you pay. He's like, no. I'm like, yeah. He goes, let's get to the bottom of this. I'm like, no, no, that's okay. He's like, come with me. We're going to get to the bottom of this. And I, I went with him. We walked to um, towards the back of the ship. The office is in, in the back, in the upper decks. Okay. The same young lady was there. And he said, this is a close friend of mine. I want you to give him a personal tour of the museum. And he gets to pick one thing out of the gift shop, whatever he would like. <laughs> like, are we good? I'm like, yeah, great. And the woman goes after he left. He was a super nice guy. And after he left, left, the woman goes, do you know who that was? I'm like, no. She goes, that was Mel Fisher. Uh. <laughs> and at the time, I still had no idea who that was. Uh-huh. I later became very good friends with him. But the interesting thing was that's what started the book. And I would love to tell you I picked like, you know, a ten thousand dollar gold coin out of his shop or something like that. No, I picked a pirate map <laughs> with all these locations of buried treasure for like you know seventy five cents. I picked that up, and that's what really initially got me started on it. And you know, at that point, you know, when other kids were reading about you know baseball or football or wanting to be a, a football player, I'm reading magazines. Um, Lost treasure, East and Western treasure, treasure found, reading about metal detectors. I got certified at the age of 12 to dive by myself. I just was fascinated with the whole idea of treasure and pirates. And then I remember reading, I think it was Frank Hudson's book about Jose Gaspar. 
they, you know, some of the stories were fantastic where you're a little kid and you dream about, well, if you're on this island at the full moon, you may see, <laughs> you know, the ghosts of one of the, the pirates that were killed and where they go into the ground, that's where they were killed. And the, the treasure is going to be buried there. You know, it was a uh-huh. little, I just love that stuff. And I dreamed of going and searching and finding some of the treasure of Jose Gaspar as a little kid. And then you know, later on, I, I got involved in more expeditions, but, and I, tutored under Commander Weller. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. He's written about six books about treasure hunting. Okay. Very successful. He brought me under his wings when I was a young man, say about, oh, maybe 21. And I trained under him for about 25 years as far as learning the industry, bringing up sunken treasure, conservation, preservation, dealing with the different government agencies and the permits and dealing with um, the SEC for... Um, adhering to their guidelines for funding. Uh Again, I would say it was that initial meeting with Mel Fisher. It's interesting because later on, I became good friends with Mel. He'd come over to the house. He'd be there with Bob and Margaret Weller, who were my mentors at the time. And, you know, they they knew each other for for years and years. Um, Super great guy. But that gives you an idea of his character that Mel Fisher always cared about kids, always wanted kids to be happy. He, He gave so much. It was a shame when he passed over the bar. Uh, yeah, I've always heard very nice things about him. Never had a chance to meet him myself, but yeah, everybody I've talked to that, that knew him always said he was uh, a really great guy like that. So that's pretty, pretty fascinating. So that is uh that's a heck of an origin story, man. I like it. Um, <laughs> so, I, I mean, it, it, it feels like a, um, it feels predetermined that you would end up where you are at this point, but that's probably not necessarily the, the, the story there. So, I mean, where there are, were there sidetracks? Were there? Did you go off in a different direction for a time and then realize that oh, I do want to come back to this treasure hunting thing? That that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I think all my life I was interested. At one point, I actually tried to run away to South America to go find the lost treasure of the Incas. Okay, didn't go over too big with mom and dad at the time. <laughs> you know, <because laughs> this is okay. This is. Going way back, I actually had a passport at the age of 14. I think I told the people at some passport agency that, oh, I'm doing this. I'm going to be visiting some relatives in South America, and my parents want me to do this it's on my own. It just is kind of to be more grown up and see if I can do this. I, I, I don't remember, but you know, it would never happen now in a million years. But honest to God, and my sister was going through my room, typical sister, looking for <laughs> And she finds my plans to go up to South America. I had been saving up money. I had a whole plan of how I was going to get there and go find the lost treasure in Incas. And I had a passport. <laughs> With mom and dad, they're like, oh, my God, he really was going to do it. Another week from now, our son would be in South America. So, and how, how old were you at the time? Wow. I'm going to say maybe 15 or 16. Okay. Yeah. So, I, again, like a, a lot of people – Went on to college. I was thinking about being involved in foreign service. Um, hence my background in languages. Uh-huh. I don't know if you if you looked initially. My bachelor's degree focused on language and linguistics, and um, I speak several languages. I also was interested in business, but it was when I met Bob again. Is it fate or is it coincidence? I just happened to uh, be going through a museum of science, a local museum of science here in Florida, and there was a display of treasure. And, they talked about this meeting, this metal detector club, and I went there, and that's when I met Bob Weller. Okay, an amazing gentleman. I I consider myself so blessed by the people I've had in my life. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with Captain Carl Fismer. Yep, uh, had him on the show. Yeah, great guy. I, I can't speak highly enough. I got some great stories about him too. Can't speak highly enough about him. I've been very blessed to have had these two people in my life. Um, but, you know, Commander Weller, again, we meet, you know, and this is, there's a lot of people in the audience. And one thing, I'll be honest, when we do a lot of these expeditions, we, we were pretty close knit because mm-hmm. trusting someone on the bottom to be bringing up gold and silver coins, you're not going to let just anyone in. Right. We call someone can sleeve a coin. You know, they can hide a coin in their wetsuit or something. So, so it, it doesn't work. We police our own, but you just don't want to deal with that. So it's a very close group. 
And for some reason, he just took me under his wing. We met. He was doing two projects, the 1715 Treasure Fleet and the uh, 1622 Treasure Fleet down in the Keys. Um, Okay. And I don't know why, but he just brought me on board. And at the time, you know, I was a young kid and he was such a positive role model in my life. He was a man who, you know, I mean, if you look at it, he was one of the co-authors of the Navy Dive Manual. He was with okay. UDT Team One. This was the forerunners of today's Navy SEALs. Uh. Officer in the Navy, you know, World War II, Korean War. Literally, honest to God, whipped behind enemy lines on a surfboard, on a longboard. <laughs> he, ex- he exited the sub. They were off the coast of Korea. Exited the sub. I think it was through the rear engine hatch. Hops on a longboard, paddles to shore to monitor troop movements. I'm like, oh, my God. Dated Marilyn Monroe. Huh. It was part of the USO tour, but yeah. just an incredible man. And he was a gentleman who luckily he took me under his wing. And he was the one that also told me, it's like, Brad, go back to school, finish your degree, your bachelor's degree. He always highly valued education and make sure you have a good day job. Keep this as something that's view it more as a great hobby, a great adventure. Okay. You, know, you need to have your, your day job. As, I don't know if you've uh, looked but a little bit about my background, bachelor's degree, languages, business, went to George Washington University, was interested in my MBA. And uh-huh. I was a 4.0, but I was more interested in medical research. So I came back. I'm finishing up another degree in genetic engineering and looking at transferring in fall to Harvard to work on my master's in genetic engineering. Fantastic. There's this uh, kind of like this this dichotomy, going, like diverse sides of my personality, which um, I think a lot of the production companies like because it's like, wait a minute. Uh, one day you're jumping out of an airplane or you're swimming with sharks in the middle of the night or sneaking into some country to do a recovery of treasure. <laughs> and the next day you're a 4.0 honor student geek in a lab coat working in a lab doing genetic engineering. Uh huh. That's me. That's very cool. Yeah, because uh, to have that kind of uh, depth of personality is important and also kind of a little bit plays into uh, the Indiana Jones mystique that uh, that uh, you treasure guys always kind of uh, give off where there is the, uh, you know, the getting in the dirt adventure kind of stuff. But then there's also the the brainy nose his way around a book kind of stuff as well. So uh, I like that. I like that a lot. I often question why there's this dichotomy in my personality, you know, where there is this adventure explorer you know jumping out of airplanes swimming in waters filled with sharks going for lost treasure but at the same time working in genetic engineering in a lab somewhere and i notice they're both roles that are explorers i like exploring the unknown that's why i'm interested in medical research with genetic engineering again it's all about exploring the unknown whether it's going through a cave system in the Seychelles Island looking for the treasure of La Bousse, or seeing if I can come up with a, a way to permanently cure diabetes. Uh-huh. Genetic engineering. They're both deal with exploring. And I thought, well, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, I like that. I like that. Uh, I think we could all use a little more sense of exploration, myself included. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're going to tell me, I, let me guess, you're one of those people that wakes up in a box Eats cereal out of a box, goes, drives in a box to an office, sits in a box in front of a box, typing away, comes home to the box, you know, <laughs> sits in front of a box with television, turns it on. No, I, I, no, wish, I try to avoid all those boxes. And, you know, and I agree. I wish that's the one thing if I could share with people more than anything. I think the important message is I am no different than anyone else. And I have got. You want to talk about every type of flaw or character flaw? Let me raise my hand right now. <laughs> you know, anyone that's got any issues, been there, done it. And if I can do that, I just want to share with people that some of the stuff they see in the movies and they dream of, that's real. That can be real. You can do that. You know, people think I'm stuck in this boring life. You know, I'm not advocating anyone to quit their job and go running out. But, you know, on your days off, go off on an adventure, you know. Go on a treasure hunt. You know, if, if you want to climb the, you know, the Matterhorn, do it. You know, if, actually, I've got a tattoo on my side right after Commander Weller passed away. Um, it, it's interesting. It's a tattoo that I have. I don't have any. 
but this is only one. Uh-huh. And what the message that it says on it is live life, no regrets. I mentioned that I want to share that with people. I wish, you know, more people would feel this way. It's like, you know, look, if you've dreamed about going to Harvard, but you're like, you know, so suppose I apply and, and I get rejected. So what? At least you try, you know, or I really want to study classical piano, but I've got to do this. Well, do it, you know, or, you know, I, I've really wanted to, as I mentioned, you know, climb Mount Everest. Well, you know something? Do it. I mean, even if you fail, fail big, but at least you did it. The last thing you want to be doing is sitting on your deathbed, looking back and regretting like, you know, I wonder what would have happened if I had, you know, I encourage everyone to live out their dreams, you know, live life with passion, live out your dreams. This is an exciting and amazing world that we're lucky enough and blessed to be a part of. Yeah. Uh, yeah, fully agree. Uh, and I, I, I do very much the same type of thing. Uh, my stuff is just more indoors, <laughs> but you know, and that's, that's true. I mean, it's the same thing. If someone like for me, with genetic engineering, someone dreams of like, you know, I want to find a cure for diabetes or something, do it. Yeah. You know, they think, Oh, I don't have the degrees or no one's going to take me seriously. You might be the person that actually does it. So, so do it. Try at the very least try. Yeah. And there's been an amazing amount of science done by non-professional scientists yes. over the centuries. Yeah. So I agree a hundred percent. Um, you know, and, uh, there's been a lot of exploration that's been done by people that may not have been, you know, academically trained in the field to do this. Or as you mentioned, some of the people that have done research and, you know, a lot of the scientific discoveries that, Sometimes it's a layman who does it. They're from the outside looking in and they're like, well, what if we do this? And all of us in academia are like, you know, they're right. We right. never thought of that. <laughs> we are so buried in it. We never, they're absolutely right. Yeah. What do they call that? A beginner's mindset? Something like that? I'll go with that. I'll go with yeah. that. I think that's what they, I, I think that's the buzzword I've heard about that idea of, uh, yeah, interesting. So, what you you do not only undersea treasure hunting and diving and things like that, but you've also done a lot of land based yes. uh, treasure hunting as well. Tell me a little bit about the the differences between those two disciplines. Where did you learn to do the land based stuff? And I'll say I started the land based first because when I was younger, I think my very first metal detector was something I got from Radio Shack for nine dollars and ninety nine cents. You know, <laughs> God bless it, it. You know, I found. I remember when I found my first penny, you would have thought I had just won an Academy Award. I was so happy and excited. I was like, yes, I can do it. I know I can do it. If I can do this, I can find treasure. So there are two different disciplines and they both have their pros and cons because sometimes doing a, an underwater operation can be, you know, depending, it can be much more of a financial burden. Getting the boat, getting the crew, getting the dive equipment, the dive gear, uh-huh. underwater. Bell detectors can be more, and it can be you know, sometimes you're dealing with rough seas, you're dealing with adverse diving conditions, but just as likely sometimes on land, you're out there in the hot sun, sweating, whether it's beach combing or I'm out in a field or I'm out in a cave system somewhere. You know, I, I remember when we were on Mona Island filming the episode for Captain Kidd's Treasure um, mm-hmm. with Josh Gates' Expedition Unknown. I mean, it was so hot there. And some of the stuff when we were going through those caves just to get up into them, there was this rickety ladder. There was like 30 feet straight up. There was literally just nailed together by driftwood that people had found over the years who had been there. And I'm like, we're going up there. I'm trying to carry my metal detector and everything else. And I'm looking at this just saying, ah, I'm not too sure I feel good about this. <laughs> <laughs> this is a little rickety. It's like I'm going to die off on season one. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I was like, I may make great news, be good for you guys, but I'm not going to see season two. (laughs) And they're both fascinating. I love both of them equally as much. Um, Hey, segueing here, a little bit of insider info and background information. Sure. Sure if I'm supposed to be saying this or not. So I'll, I'll try to be vague on it because when we were doing the filming for that episode, um, this was dealing with captain kid and his treasure. I firmly believe Mona Island could be a, a great source for where his treasure could be buried. And when we went there, it's interesting because that's a very tightly controlled island. It's by the um, Puerto Rican. Uh, it's actually a, a nature preserve, and it's a an agency of the um, government of Puerto Rico. Okay, no one's allowed on that island. 
No one, just a couple park rangers. Mm. There's no running water. The, the reason I'm mentioning this is when we got there, one of the rangers pulled me aside. I guess he done his background info on me, looked up everything about me. And they said, you know, one of the rangers wants to meet with you. He pulled me aside and showed me some of the treasure that he had found. Really? And I won't mention his name. That never made it to the show or anything because, you know, everyone now everyone's going to be trying to go to that island. Um, <laughs> and, you know, people ask, well, if you think it's so great, why didn't you continue working there? It's so tightly regulated. And trust me, those park rangers, if they're finding stuff, they're not going to want us trying to go in there and steal. You know, they've got their little cachet. They're looking. They're not going to want competition. And there's only one possible place to get to that island by boat. So it's monitored. But that's a little background info that there really is treasure on that island when the park rangers showed me some of the treasure that they had been finding. That's interesting. I mean, because the the, uh, the the general thought about buried pirate treasure is that pirates probably didn't bury their treasure. They probably just spent it right away because uh, they were not good financial planners. So uh, what kind of connection would that treasure possibly have to Captain Kidd? Was there something timeline-wise that made sense? It does. And actually, I do agree with you on that. And Sometimes I, I, I don't like saying that because I don't want to destroy people's dreams when I say, well, they're, probably, <laughs> and they're like, great, thank you. Just like um, I'm looking at doing an episode with um, another for season six with Expedition Unknown on the pirate uh, Jose Gaspar. OK, you know, I, I, I did, yes, there were a lot of pirates, small local pirates in the area. And you can tell I'm being very careful as I'm saying this right now because I don't want to destroy anyone's dreams. I, I of don't. Course. I think anyone can definitively prove that he did or he didn't exist. I mean, you read the story, it reads like something out of like a romance novel. It's so like, you know, he was with the uh, Spanish Navy and a lady of the court was interested in him, but he wasn't. His heart belonged to someone else. And so he declared it. Well, you know, could it be true? I, you know, it, it reads like, you know, an adventure novel. Yeah. You know, again, I, I don't want to definitively say, no, he didn't exist or anything because I don't want to, you know, they have a great festival and it's like, look, guys, understand, enjoy. And you know something? I don't think anyone can definitively prove whether he did or didn't exist. So you got to uh-huh. go to the festival, enjoy. Just like with buried pirate treasure. Again, I agree with you on that. Now, I do believe there's a possibility of small little caches of treasure because sometimes they may have spent it right away, which is true. But, you know, with Captain Kidd, there was a belief. And again, a lot of times with pirates, so much of this stuff, you always have to say, according to legend, or it appears. Right. Because nothing is very clearly documented. But, you know, after, I guess, his raid on the Kada merchant and the treasure that he recovered from that, you know, because Captain Kidd, and trust me, I'm sure a lot of your audience is much more knowledgeable of the history than I am. But basically, as we know, I mean, he, at that time, was, it was a, privateer and he was established in new england he came he was very well connected with society and i think he was trying to like a lot of the pirates they were trying to maybe he would have tried to bargain it's like look i've got some of this treasure i'll turn it over to you i I just want a pardon for lack of better terms you know okay i want to be exonerated of this it was a mistake i I just have some type of a bargaining chip so you know, he had the Kadal Merchant. It would have been a great place to leave some stuff. You know, and the, we have the, as you saw in the episode, we actually dove on the Kadal Merchant because he switched to a smaller ship. At that point, she was just kind of like a leaking, rotting vessel, a large vessel. Uh-huh. To switch to a smaller ship to make his way to New England to ideally try, to, I guess, to arrange some type of an amnesty. And, you know, again, it just to me, if I put myself in that shoes, if I had something, I wouldn't want to carry it on me. Because I've just lost all my bargaining power. Sure. If I wanted to get back into my role in society and back to my life, I, I would need something to be able to offer to persuade the courts or at the time to grant me some type of an amnesty. Yeah, I, I don't think that there's uh, there would never have been a reason for them to, you know, bury some loot somewhere because, uh, they're, you know, if they thought they were being chased and they needed to ditch it for temporarily and then they couldn't go back and get it. So there's all sorts of reasons it could be there. Uh, but it's always interesting to hear different viewpoints on that idea. Let's talk Jose Gaspar a little bit because the okay. the, the prevailing knowledge on him was that either he didn't exist or that he was a very minor and not very successful pirate that somehow had a, a huge 
Floridian festival <laughs> designed around him that has now gone for over a hundred years. Yes. So w- tell me about what you know about, about Jose Gaspar that might make him a real person. Well, that's a tough one. Um, it's almost more so that someone can, cannot definitively prove that he did not exist. Okay. And again, there were a lot of small pirates in the area at the time. Um, the U.S. sent a squadron down there, a naval squadron, to rid the water of pirates. You know, what was interesting was one of my good friends, Steve Singer, when he was doing his research for his book, Shipwrecks of Florida, a um, little plug there, <laughs> Steve, uh-huh. one of the things he did was he was investigating the naval archives and you know, according to legend, Jose Gaspar, he was going to be retiring. He went on his ship and he set out sail. It was going to be one last easy capture. And of course, and we all know the story. He came alongside what he thought was a merchant ship. All of a sudden opens up its broadsides. All these cannons come out and launch a broadside on him. Ship goes down. But now the interesting thing was there actually was according to my friend Steve Singer that did research in the Naval Archives, yes, the U.S. did have a fleet in that area to rid the waters of pirates right at that time. Okay. So, you know, did someone, when they were doing their research on this, know that and put that in? Who knows? Did that come later? Um, but it, again, it's it, it's hard to disprove that he didn't exist. So, um, you know, it, it's a great story. I'd be interested in doing some more work in that area. The, the sad thing is, um, well, an interesting thing, my good friend, Captain Carl Fismer, he actually has been to the island of Carl Pleu. As I believe okay. you pronounce it. Someone will probably correct me, but I believe it's the island <laughs> of Carl Pleu is how you pronounce it, <clears throat> which according to legend was to be the, the base camp of Jose Gaspar. Okay. And, reason he set this up and you know this does make sense you're going into port royal like you know some of the other pirates at the time and people are drinking they're talking they're spinning and so word gets out you know the authorities can find out who you are where your ship is captured so he wanted to set up his own kind of base far away from port so one of his main strongholds was the island of carl where he set up warehouses docks, you know, shipyard, taverns and everything. So it was, he was under control. That's where all his men and a lot of it ill gotten loot would stay. And then he would, you know, sell it in different markets as legend uh, says. Now, Carl actually got permission to go on the Island and search. Cause I thought if anything, that would be, if, if that legend is true, that would be a neat place to look. Sure. Primarily because, you know, one, are there actual structures there? Can we find any evidence that, supports this legend you know if we found like foundations of warehouses or anything or any artifacts that there was a settlement here plus maybe if someone you know just an ordinary seaman uh, may have tried bearing some of him his little share of it say me say we got 10 pieces of eight or something like that i mean you're sleeping and sharing your your, your bunking quarters with a bunch of pirates and thieves you're not going to want to keep it you probably want to keep it hidden somewhere you know you might find some smaller caches of coins on that island okay and the interesting thing is he actually approached the owner of the island and got permission to do it. And it was funny. This is a great story. Carl tells us that you know, he said when he approached the owner of the island, he said, Carl, you're the first person who ever asked my permission to go looking. He's every time I go to the island, there's holes dug all over it for everyone who thinks they're going <laughs> to treasure. You know, and it's so annoying. He said, since you're the first person that asked, me, I'm going to give you permission. Yes, you can go. You've got my complete commission to go ahead and do it. And you know, he, he did find some artifacts there. He did find, um, oh, I forgot the term of it, where you bring the ship up at high tide when you're uh, cleaning the hull and cleaning it. He okay. did find those runners going into the water. Huh. Now, was that there was some settlement there? Was now was that Jose Gaspar's settlement, as legend says, um, or was that you know some other smaller pirates? Uh, could have been a, a different smaller group, or could have been just some a settlement. Who knows? But it, it's it's interesting that he found that stuff. So yeah, okay, yeah, interesting. So are you working on that project with? Uh, um Expedition Unknown as well? I've been in touch with them. We're looking at possibly doing an episode on that. I'm not sure how much I'm supposed to say because okay. I've done stuff like the you know Captain Kid Treasure or um, Jean Lafitte. 
we're always under an agreement that I'm not allowed to talk about it or post any photos until after the show airs, which, you know, I gotcha. understand because, you know, I, I go on social media. Hey, guys, this is a whole thing. And here's the episode right here. And here's photos. And they're like, well, why are we going to watch the episode? We just got <laughs> So we're always, uh, you know, that's one thing that they do uh, ask us if we're part of that show. But, uh, you know, another thing I'm just going to share with you behind the scenes Sure. I I have to be honest. When they do their research, they really do the research very well. They've always brought me on the show because of my knowledge of pirates and um, history of pirates and pirate treasure and, you know, some of the expeditions I've done bringing up sunken treasure. But I'm always so impressed with the research that they've done and the documents that they pull up. And that's, I think, what makes the show a good success is the fact that Josh has got a great personality. He's a very fun, amicable guy, makes you something like you'd want to go do something with being an adventure. It's a great like travel log. You can see interesting places and you do learn a lot of the history on it. So actually you know, a lot of this stuff I have on my website, treasureexpeditions.com, where I, I post a lot of this stuff on, you know, the different pirates, their background, um, their possible treasures and some of the stuff behind the scene photos of the episodes that I've done with them or for other TV shows, such as the Custos show, um, that was it Caribbean pirate treasure. Uh-huh. They were a pleasure to work with also. Um, yeah. Once again, I've just been very lucky with some of the people that I have in my life or been a part of my life. I'm that I'm truly blessed. Certainly. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about working with Philippe Cousteau. Cause I haven't had him on the show yet. One thing I have to tell you, um, this is probably, my first experience at uh, being involved in a, a potential show. Yeah, well, you know, they're trailers, but this was something that you know, was very serious. We were shooting the pilot episode. Uh-huh. And, of course, Jacques Cousteau. I, you know, as a kid, I remember watching, what's that, the amazing undersea world of Jacques Cousteau. And yeah. I, you know, grandfather who invented scuba diving and everything. And just a legend hit his ship, the Calypso. Yep. And it was someone that was his grandson. And I was just like, oh, my gosh, you know. And I, I wasn't sure, you know, how he was going to treat me, how he was going to be. I admit Bob Asher, who was the producer, you know, met him at a pirate festival um, huh. up in Fort Pierce. And we did some initial filming. And you know, I got to tell you, I was so impressed with how nice and supportive they were. That's one thing. I, again, I've been lucky. So many people have been so nice and supportive, uh, you know, because the first time you're being filmed. Luckily, I seem to be comfortable with it. Yeah, because you know, don't look at the camera, you know, just be right. natural <laughs> and stuff. You know, they say that, but it, they really made me feel very comfortable. Um, super nice guy. Um, his wife was spectacular too. It was fun filming with them. Uh, it was cute. I brought some of the treasure that I had brought up and I showed them. And, you know, his wife was kind of funny. She was making it like she was taking some of it and sticking it down her, you know, top of her bathing suit. And her <laughs> there. It's like, oh, oh, just let me just catch it. Like, uh, okay, those are yours. I can't go after those. <laughs> Your husband's right there. <laughs> you just got them. They, they're yours now. Um, but super, super nice. And, you know, when you consider the amazing things he's done and, you know, the legacy that he comes from that, you know, again, that they would be very nice, down to earth people. That's, I, I've been very lucky on that, that I haven't met anyone that had that arrogant attitude or anything like that. So that's good. That's good to hear. And I think, uh, you know, part of that is when you're not like that, you tend to avoid those people uh, just sort of naturally. Cause people ask me that about comedians I've met as well too. And I, I, all the, the big headliners that I've met or worked with have always been fantastic people. Uh, and it's, and anybody that's not fantastic, and, and a nice person like that, I tend to generally avoid anyway, and I wouldn't even be into the work in the first place, you know? So yeah, that, I think that's a big part of it is just being that type of person will gravitate you towards those type of people. You know, and I agree. There's that old saying, I think it's kind of trite and people don't take it seriously, but I think there's a lot of truth in it that like attracts like and sure. water its own level. And, you know, again, I'm not saying this in any way to promote myself, but I've been very blessed with some of the, you know, good people like, you know, Commander Weller or AKA Frogfoot. There's a great story there on how I got the name Frogfoot, but um, nicknamed that, <laughs> you know, Fizz and just down to earth warm people. Now, have you ever met Louis Anderson? 
No, uh, I want to say we crossed paths somewhere in Vegas at one point, but I don't think I've, I've never like sat and talked with him. Super nice guy. Super down to earth. Um, it, it was interesting because, again, I don't take myself seriously. This is just kind of funny. His agent called me and was like, you know, it's coming off my came on my cell phone. It's like, oh, is this the Bradley Williamson? Are, are, are you Bradley Williamson? I'm like, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Louis Anderson would love to meet with you. Is there any way you might be willing to have dinner with him? You know, because he's really into this treasure hunting and everything. And I'm like, okay. You know, <laughs> of course, my friends at the you know university or the friends that I work with in the labs, they're all teasing me. And they're like, you know, I'm like, yeah, I know. Brad, go watch the beakers in the back of the room. I know. Don't take yourself too seriously. But you know. <laughs> it was so funny because here's someone, he just won an Emmy. And it's like, you know, listen, I'm just the average guy. You're somebody. I'm just me. I'm just Brad. Um, but he's very interested in treasure hunting. He was looking at possibly putting a show together on that. And Really? You know, yeah, it was interesting because a, a good friend of mine, Mike Daniels, who found Blackbeard's ship, the Queen Anne's Revenge, uh-huh. a good friend of mine, we went to go meet with him. And I'm not sure if I should say this or not, but you know, there were other – you know, politicians and other people meeting him backstage. Louis kicked them all out <laughs> so he could just talk to, to <laughs> myself and Mike Daniels about, you know, pirates and pirate treasure and treasure hunting. <laughs> you know, it was so funny. Super nice guy. We've, we've stayed friends since then. But um, that's interesting. I did not know that about him. That is funny. Who knew? Me neither. Yeah, <laughs> that's crazy. Um, well, if I run across him, I now I know what to bring up with him to, uh, to get him talking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so. Uh, besides the gas bar thing, what kind of uh, projects do you have on your plate right now? Wow. I have a lot of projects on my plate. Um, underwater, I've got a 1792 galleon. I've got um, a, a Spanish merchant ship we're in the process of working on. I will be doing the 1715 treasure fleet. And it looks as though we are getting the permission from the uh, Bureau of Historic Resources here in Florida to move forward with the recovery on um, the artifacts from the Ringling Brothers wreck. Oh, wow. On the Bailey Circus, which would be fascinating. Yeah. In addition, this is something that's really interesting. Um, and, and again, I, I agree with you. I've not been a, a big fan of the you know, pirates, you know, the, the treasure with this vast hoard of treasure. But this is something that's just right out of Treasure Island and the Goonies. Okay. It's about everyone I know. I mean, these are real successful treasure hunters that, you know, uh, you know, like myself at times, have, we've had archaeologists on our payroll, financial backers. We're dealing with government agencies. We're dealing with, you know, very businesslike. Just about every one of them has a copy of the Goonies. Steven Spielberg. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a class. We all know. I mean, it's it, it's totally Hollywood. It's just totally Steven Spielberg movie magic. But it's, it's such a cute, heartwarming. And we all wish we could be like, you know, imagine just – being on a a treasure hunt with a legendary pirate and a pirate map and solving the riddles and going with a cave system with traps and stuff and find this pirate treasure. It's like, you know, all of us, that's our dream because people don't realize when we're out there actually doing a lot of these recoveries, it's very, it's very tough work. It's, you know, a lot of routine. I think for every silver piece of eight I found, I've probably brought up 80 beer cans. (laughs) (laughs) People don't see that side. Um, But I am actually involved with something with a gentleman, Tyrone. Um, He's based in South Africa, but he's got the permission with the government of the Seychelles to go after what we believe is the treasure of Labus, Oliver Labosh, or Leo Labus, the buzzard. Yeah, this is I mean, this literally is something along the lines of, you know, the Goonies meets Robert Lewis's Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island. Here was this gentleman. He did exist. He was a very successful pirate, um, predominantly operating off of Madagascar. And I mean, it is documented. He did get that Portuguese great galleon. I think it's called the Cabo with, you know, a fantastic amount of treasure on it. So much treasure that it, I, you know, literally it's almost like a a Disney movie or a Spielberg movie. There was so much on this, right? The gold bars, the silver bars, the gold coins, you know, the chests of diamonds. I mean, now, Again, you know, the person's going to say, well, yeah, how much of this is real? Yeah. My good friends, who is probably one of the top rated archaeologists internationally, did the research. You know, 
based out of France. That's one of his, like, he did the research in the French archives. And he's like, yes, Brad, Oliver Levasseur did exist. He, everything, you know, you're talking about where the capturing of the Portuguese great galleon with that fantastic treasure, you know, the Cabo and everything that is documented, you know, but it's, it's interesting because they did go on to say that, like you mentioned, there was so much that there was, you know, and literally this is in the archives and you know, for an archaeologist to say, because an archaeologist is going to try and diminish that as much as possible. It just, unfortunately, that's an area to go into. Sometimes the division between the, uh, the state archaeologist and the private treasure hunter. Um, okay. And different, uh, different goals in mind. Yeah. It's, it's funny because me personally, I believe in, you know, the two of us coming together. I think, yes, you know, we should have the private sector moving. I, I don't want to take that away from someone's, you know, where everyone dreams of finding some treasure and the state comes, no, you can't touch that. If you do that and you're in violation, that belongs to the state. Everyone dreams of being able to find, you know, some lost or sunken treasure. And I, I like the way the British government does it. Whereas if they find something, if it is of unique historic value, yes, it should be in a museum. Uh-huh. I agree with that. But they compensate you for it. They said, you know, look, you went out and you found it. We're going to get three independent appraisals and we will, you know, find the medium between the three and we'll compensate you for it. If it's not something, it's like, you know, we've already got a, a gazillion gold doubloons. We don't need any more gold doubloons. Keep them, right. they're yours. I like that attitude. And I like the idea of being able to continue on the private sector. But, you know, having an archaeologist on board, doing the recoveries to, you know, archaeological proceed, you know, protocol and procedures. So I have friends, it's, it's interesting. We keep our friendship quiet because I understand for their role, they may not want to be associated with someone that's labeled a treasure hunter. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, and I understand because if they know who I am, that would be, uh, what do you want to call it? Career suicide for them. But hopefully one time we'll, we'll come to a place where we can work together and we can proceed forward on this stuff. Um, I think I think it would be great for everyone. You know, everyone has that dream of being able to do it and find the lost, buried, sunken treasure. And, you know, like in the movie Fool's Gold, you know, they find the treasure. They have this great. I, I wish it was a lot like that, where you 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 find this financial backer. You're off on this luxury yacht and you're diving in crystal clear, warm water, bringing up all this sunken treasure, and you know you live happily ever after. You don't have to deal with litigation, the IRS, you know, the state <laughs> regulatory issues. No, that doesn't belong to you. That belongs to the government. We're taking that from you. You know what? You know, unfortunately, <laughs> that's some of the reality we're dealing with nowadays. But, you know, the reason I, and I went off on a segue there, you know, the interesting thing with Labus is when these top archaeologists were saying, yes, you know, when they're doing the research in the archives, because to me, that's you know, like one of the things Fizz and I offer are these classes we call where we teach people how to go out and do their own expeditions. Okay. Because uh, many times, yeah, you know, I was contracted by Princess Cooter's line. So Fizz and I, we did these you know, presentations. It was called Treasures of the Caribbean. Mm-hmm. We were like their top three act. We talk about, you know, when you go to a port of call, the pirates that are in that, you know, were in that area and you know, the possibility of some of the sunken or buried treasure that was there. I mean, that just changed the whole attitude for people are like, Okay, we're going on the same old routine cruise ship. Okay, <laughs> we're going to go to the same old tourist stops. Okay, we'll get the T-shirts. But by doing this, now all of a sudden, they're like, not only are we on a vacation, but we're on an adventure. And they loved it. But, you know, we also thought it'd be great. Some of these people would like to know more about how to do this themselves. So Fizz and I, we offer these courses where we literally tell them, you know, they, they come and there's a classroom session where we tell them, you know, how to do research on the uh, project you're getting interested in, say if it's a pirate treasure, how to do the research on it, um, how to get financial backers or how to fund it, how to deal with the government agencies or regula- regulations you're probably going to have to deal with, how to, you know, what equipment you would need, just the whole process so people leave there knowing how to do it. And then we take them out diving on two Spanish treasure galleons. So they interesting the experience because it's one thing to read about in a book, but to actually be on a site diving on it because – I can't tell you how many people have probably swum across, you know, a, a sunken Spanish treasure guy or, a, you know, a pirate ship, a sunken pirate ship, with treasure that would have been on. And they don't know because uh-huh, they don't. Yeah. Just like, you know, as we all know, when Mel Fisher found the Atosha, 
I mean, here's these stacks of silver bars that have got spear gun shanks lodged in them because people were out there spear fishing and they didn't even know <laughs> it got trapped in it. Or and I, um, a gentleman, he was something he was very successful in a treasure recovery. He did, you know, he brought up a large amount of treasure, but initially he didn't know they were sitting right on the site. Because he never knew what a ballast stone looked like. You know, the stones that they carried in the bilge of the ship to try and keep it yeah. without knowing that. And so that's why when we do that stuff, it, it gives them, you know, a, a complete, uh, they're learning everything in the classroom. They actually are out there diving it. And so, you know, this way, some of these people can actually live out their dreams. That sounds absolutely fascinating. And I know if I were on a cruise ship, I would uh, definitely take that. Are you doing that uh, off of cruise ships as well? Is there any sort of program other people can take who aren't cruisers? Well, yeah, that's why we have the cruise ship, but also the one that we offer right now. It's down in the Keys. <clears throat> okay. It's literally, you know, we have people, I've li- we've literally had people fly from other countries to come and attend this. But other people, if they're in the United States, they just, some of them, if they're far away, they fly. Some of them drive down. Some of them are locals. And the attend it's, it's just, it's basically, it's a one-day workshop. And, you know, the first half of it is where they get to meet with Fizz or I, and they've either seen us on TV or in a book, you know, write about our recoveries. And we're there in a store where they can see some of the treasures that we've brought up from our expeditions are all around them. And then we talk with them and we keep it small, maybe about like, you know, 20, 25 people, 20 people, I would say at most. And so this way it's a very intimate relationship where they can talk to us one-on-one in case there's questions we don't cover. And then we take them out diving down the keys. So there's both the cruise ship and what we do here, Locally, it's a uh, one-day class. We're looking at making it into a two-day class, but it's a one-day class down here um, in Florida. Yeah, and I like that it's not just we're going to just take you diving on a ship and you might find something, but that you're also giving them the information about how to do the research and deal with the governments. And I think that's an interesting background element to put in there that I haven't I haven't seen other people talk about. So that's that's pretty cool. I know with a lot of this stuff, when we're filming, we can be filming for days and you never know where that gold nugget is. Sure. It, come, it all cuts down to like five minutes of airtime, but it's good five minutes of airtime. But <laughs> So let's let's do one last thing here. I would like to hear about some of the charity and nonprofit work that you do because you do have a, a research foundation that I cannot pronounce, uh, pronounce. I also cannot pronounce pronounce it today for some reason. So um, tell me first about that. Well, there's a, a lot of different things that I do. You know, for myself... There is the, the dichotomy of my personality where there is the, you know, the treasure hunter, the explorer going off on these expeditions around the globe, finding stuff. But there's that other part of me who is the research scientist. And uh-huh. I do have the Immortalitatum Research Foundation, which I'm promoting the development of medical research where because of my background studying genetic engineering and continuing on with my path in that towards the MD, PhD. I want to share a lot of the research and discoveries that we're, we're finding because I literally am looking for cures. I think too much now in the medical community, they're looking for treatments. Okay. But, you know, I'm interested in, in finding cures instead of treatments, which unfortunately I think everyone wants to treat something because there's a lot of money in it. And uh. pharmaceutical companies are really not going to like me right now. But, <laughs> you know, I'm interested in being able to share with me the treatments because for me – when, you know, some of the leaps we've made in science where, you know, treating someone who's a diabetic, you know, when we found out that we could get insulin from bovine, it, you know, that was a big leap forward. And then through genetic engineering, where we found out with E. coli, we can actually, I, I've done this myself already in the lab, where we introduce the gene into them and they actually produce in these, you know, these huge vats, pharmaceutical grade, I mean, pure uh, insulin. Huh. A lot of people don't realize that that's where it comes from. It's actually from, we use E. coli. We work with it all the time in the lab and they're actually, they're producing it. And it's because you know, there's no contamination. It's pure grade insulin. But I would love the day when we can actually look at someone and say, well, we see the problem here. It's um, you have a defective gene on chromosome 16, locus P40-A. We'll use the CRISPR-Cas9, which I think there's a photo of me on my personal site with Marie Charpentier, who will, and we're all of us in the scientific community are just waiting for her to be awarded the Nobel Prize for her research and development of CRISPR-Cas9, where we can almost edit the human gene 
as precisely as using a scalpel. It's just, it's incredibly forward where we can look at someone and say, okay, you know, all these are treatments, but they've been great leaps forwards. But now if we could look at someone and say, well, you have a defective gene on chromosome 16, locus P40-A, we're going to use CRISPR-Cas9 to remove the defective gene. We'll insert uh, a properly functioning gene. So now your body will produce the insulin that it needs and you're cured. I, I know that's right. really simplistic, but that's what I would like to see. So that's why I, I want to make some of this information available. But I also do a lot of work with, um, oh, the ARC advocates. Um, it, it, they're dealing with children. We're advocates for dealing with the rights for children that um, have special needs. I, I even go into uh, jails or prisons unescorted. Literally, I'm, I'm locked in there. Not probably the first thing to do, but, you know, just to try and talk to some of them to get them to turn their lives around. Because, again, it all goes back to I have been so blessed with some of the people that I have in my life. And I wonder where I would be if some of these people hadn't been part of my life. You know, if sure. the commander, Bob Willer, if he hadn't been a part of my life, who, um, you know, opened the whole idea of treasure hunting to me and made it a part of my life and, you know, continuing on my education, Carl Fismer. Now yeah, I've been lucky to have him. Yeah, I've been so blessed. So I want to try and offer something to those, you know, young kids out there that haven't had a mentor in their life, haven't had someone that says, look, you can do it. You know, as Henry Ford once said, whether you believe you can or you believe you can't, you're right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Whatever you put, you might do. You know, don't let anyone tell you. It's generally the people that are closest to you that are going to say, oh, you're dreaming. Oh, you know, the people you're looking for to support. And again, it goes back to, you know, live your life to the fullest. I mean, follow your dreams. That's one of my company mottos. Follow your dreams that you can actually see it. I have it written in Latin on the site. It was actually Bill Moore that came up with that. And that's that's one of my themes. But one thing, if I can, segueing back before Uh uh, we lose this, because I think your audience might be interested in this because I know we've gone off on some tangents here and I apologize, but to come back. No, that's okay. You know, one of the projects that I'm really excited about right now, along with the other ones that I mentioned, is moving forward on this expedition to see if we can find you know, the fabled treasure of Oliver Le Vachur, La Bousse. Uh-huh. Uh, because, you know, again, it's, he did exist. I mean, he did recover you know, a fabulous treasure from the... Uh, a Portuguese great guy that's been documented by um, and verified by archaeologists, archaeologists who have done primary research. Cause that's one thing in the classes at FIS and I teach, you always tell people it's like, just cause you read about in a book doesn't, you know, you need to have primary research from the archives. Sure. And the fact that one well, of the top archaeologists, who's a friend of mine has told me, it's like, yes, Brad, I've been to St. Marie. I've been to the archives. I've read the ancient for us. He did exist. They did find this fabulous treasure. So much they had so much, as you were mentioning, it was documented. Some of the pirates were paying, you know, paying for bottles of rum with diamonds. They just had so much. It was ridiculous. <laughs> and it's just it's a great fun story because the really interesting thing is the gentleman I'm working with, Tyrone, has permission from the government of the Seychelles to move forward with an expedition and do a recovery. Okay. Most of the times, and especially a lot of when I'm working with TV, they don't realize all the work that goes into it and just dealing with the different government agencies and getting permission. And, and, you know, you got to admit that it's a great fun story where there was legendary legend had it that there was this cryptogram that he created and he threw out into the audience when he was about to be hung because again, like many pirates, he was trying to work with the French government, you know, great amnesty. He's getting older. I want to be able to not look over my shoulders for the rest of my life. And can we work something out? Uh, but apparently the French government wanted more than he he was willing to give. It was just too much. He said, forget it. Big mistake because, you know, later on he did get captured off Madagascar and eventually was hung. But, you know, he threw this cryptogram out into the audience that he wrote that said, he amongst you have knowledge. Here's the clues to my treasure. Something along those lines stood out. And so it's got this you know, treasure map of these cryptograms. And, I, you know, it's... It's fascinating because it's this whole cave system that um, we've been exploring. I mean, there's really markings drawn on the caves and understanding and some of the, the traps that are there. It's, uh-huh. you know, we're actually going to be, and this is something that might be interesting. We're actually going to be promoting it on 
my site, Treasure Expeditions, and through Tyrone, through Twitter. So people that are interested in Pirates and Pirate Treasure can be following this, literally kept up to date on it. And I would honestly say, if there truly is something there, this is probably the best chance or the, the best expedition to actually do the recovery that I've seen this gentleman's research. I know the depths that he went to. And if anyone's going to pull this off, I think it's going to be him, Tyrone. I'm, I'm glad to be a part of it, being able to share it with not only people I know, but also your audience. So they can actually be up to date and following on it. You know, they could click on a link at work and see a podcast and like, Hey, you know, it cameras on, we're connected to, one of the live feeds on their um, camera they're wearing on their head. We could actually see them walking with them as they're going into this cave system. Eight, yeah. That's something I think that's going to be very exciting, which I'm looking forward to. Yeah, that's really great. Uh, I, yeah, I'll be following along too. It sounds like you've got just tons of awesome stuff happening and uh, I look forward <laughs> to seeing the results. And I want to see an entire episode about beer cans you found uh, because <laughs> What kind of beer did LaBoose drink? That is the real question we need answered, right? I agree 100%. I agree. <laughs> I wish. It, you know, it's funny because I often wonder, you know, like we mentioned before, it's like, you know, for every piece of eight you find, you have to dig up 100 beer cans. You know, who knows? One of these beer cans actually could have, or beer bottles, could have been extremely rare that some collector would have paid me $100,000 for. And I was like, <laughs> oops, I was going after the Oh, treasure. It is a treasure. Right. It's, in the beer it's in old beer bottles. God, <laughs> yeah. Funny. Well, Brad, this has been super fun, man. I really appreciate your time. And uh, where where is a good place for people online to keep track of what you're doing? I would say um, Treasure Expeditions, treasureexpeditions.com All right. would be a great place. It's basically it's an online treasure magazine. You can read about our expeditions we have going on right now dealing with pirates and pirate treasure. Um, we also provide a source of information for people that want to proceed forward on some of their own expeditions. There's an area where we provide, I make free stuff available to them, showing them how to set up their own um, reverse electrolysis tank to conserve and preserve some of the artifacts they bring up. Or if they want to follow me personally, bradleywilliamson.com is my personal site. So either treasureexpeditions.com or bradleywilliamson.com. Fantastic. Good. That'll all be in the show notes. And uh, yeah, it's, I, I look forward to following your projects, man. Thanks again for uh, taking the time to come on and chat with us. Honestly, you don't know how honored I am to be a, a part of this and to that you're interested in having me. And I'm so grateful for this because it's something I've really wanted to do. And I am consider myself very lucky to be a part of a show like this. Thank I'm you. I'm so glad to hear it. I really, really so appreciate you. that a lot. Thank you for all the viewers out there that actually have entered. I'm so grateful to for you guys, too. So without you guys, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing without your support. So thank you, everyone that's listening to this podcast. Thank you so much for your support. And I would just encourage anyone who's listening to this to follow your dreams. If, if you have interested in doing something like this, I mean, feel free to reach out to me. I've got my personal contact info on the websites, and I will do all that I can to help you follow your dreams. You know, if someone has an expedition they want to go on, feel free to email me. I'll try and share any of my knowledge and help you in any way that I can. Perfect. Thanks, Brad. I appreciate it. You got it, Phil. Thank you so much for your time, buddy. And there it is, friends. That is my talk with Brad Williamson of treasureexpeditions.com. If you want to find out more about what he's up to, again, go to treasureexpeditions.com because duh. And of course, you can uh, check out his uh, his regular site, his personal site at bradleywilliamson.com as well. Show notes for this episode are at underthecrossbones.com slash 181. And in there, I will have a link to uh, the book Shipwrecks of Florida by Steve Singer that was mentioned during the show. Uh, that'll be an Amazon link and it'll help support the show if you use that. So even if you're thinking about you know, going over to Amazon to buy it, uh, click on through the show notes first. You can do that right there in your pod player and uh, and then click our link and we get a few pennies and that helps everything. Everything it helps. Everything it helps global warming. <laughs> I don't know if it helps global warming. I don't think it does, but it helps me and that would be awesome and it helps the show. So what did you like? What did you not like? Uh, did you hear a place where you wanted to jump in with your two cents and uh, contribute to the conversation? You can do that. 
because that's the way the world works now. Come on over to Facebook, facebook.com slash under the crossbones. Leave us a little comment there. There'll be a thread for this episode and you can uh, leave any sort of comment that uh, you would like there. Well, not something, you know, pertaining, not any sort of comment. I don't want to hear about, you know, what color underwear you're wearing today. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. What, what color underwear you're wearing today? <laughs> I just want to see who does it now. I want to see who does it. All right. I'm putting that out there. <laughs> Ridiculous. We're sponsored today by Pirate Radio, the Treasure Coast, of course, WKKC-DB, playing the best music of today's hits and yesterday's classics, and Pirate Radio Talk, playing the best pirate shows, including Under the Crossbones, 24-7, all commercial free. To listen, go to PirateRadioTheTreasureCoast.com or pick up the Pirate Radio WKKC-DB app in your favorite app store. Or uh, for the talk station, go to PirateRadioTC.com or pick up the Pirate Radio Talk app in your favorite app store. Or just ask your Alexa or Google device. Just go, okay, Google, play. Oops, see, mine just did it right there. It's because I'm holding my phone in my hand as I'm reading this to you. Say, uh, okay, Google, or hey, Alexa, or whatever the heck. It, oh, I did it again. Sorry. Shush, Google. Uh, <laughs> just talk to your device. Tell it to play Pirate Radio, the Treasure Coast for you, or under the crossbones, and it will do that. Sometimes when you don't want it to. So, because they're always listening. The robots are always listening. All brought to you, of course, by iTreasure Radio, the very best digital media from independently owned stations at iTreasureRadio.com. And that is our show for today. Thank you once again for tuning in. I always, always appreciate it. Again, if you want to find out more about what Brad Williamson is up to, go to TreasureExpeditions.com or BradleyWilliamson.com. And all that kind of stuff will be there. Show notes for this episode, UnderTheCrossbones.com slash 181. Next week, we're going somewhere we've never gone before on this show. Uh, not We're going to Australia, but we've been there. But where we're going is the world of independent wrestling. Yeah. How does that fit in? Why? We're going to talk to Graham Bucky, a.k.a. The Buccaneer. Yes, he's an independent wrestler from Australia. And we're going to talk about the world of indie wrestling. It's fascinating. I think you're going to dig it. Uh, we're trying something else uh, new on the show next week as well. I'll tell you about that next week uh, as we get into it, but I think it'll be fun. Uh, I've got a couple other uh, interviews on the calendar for this week that aren't in the can yet. I'm running, man, I'm really running close to my deadlines here. I gotta, I'm got trying to stockpile them, but it's, uh, it's been, been busy around here. Anyway, I've got a couple of cool interviews on the calendar for this week, so I'll tell you about those later on when those actually happen. I don't want to jinx them. I don't want to jinx them. You know how it works. And if you have a suggestion for a guest on the show, be that yourself or someone you think would be cool, uh, email me, phil at underthecrossbones.com. I'm always open to suggestions and uh, happy to hear from you on any such thing uh, pertaining to the show and other things. All right. So there you go. And I will see you next week where we're talking wrestling. Bye. Bye.